to the uh, Wednesday night uh, services, and usually we have a uh, devotional speaker and then one conducting class. But David is kindly permitting me to take up the entire period, since uh, what I have to say is, well, actually, it's going to take uh, two Wednesday nights to get it all done. So next time, I'll do about half of it tonight, and next time, whenever that is, I'll do the other half. So you get more opportunities to, to read the uh, book of Esther. Probably I'll get through the uh, first five chapters of Esther, maybe six, but five for sure. But anyway, it's a very interesting book. It's, uh, it's, it's one of two books named for women, uh, the other book being Ruth. Now, one thing interesting about um, either book, there's no recorded miracle miracle in either book. And God is not mentioned in Esther. But in both, the, the marvelous workings of providence are clear. And Esther is also the marvelous uh, story of redemption. So I think... Best I recall, there was a movie made about Esther. I don't remember the, the name. Nancy might remember the name, but it's probably one of those uh, Hallmark feel good movies. Now, uh, you know, of course, Hallmark, I mean, the Hollywood uh, made movies should not be taken at face value. Hollywood is very rarely portrays uh, reality. It's a natural tendency that we have, I think, to romanticize these stories, especially when Hollywood gets behind it to, you know, make a buck or two. But we should not be deluded about the reality of ancient society. All royal tenure and prerogatives are based on, uh, just based solely on Hollywood trails. Back then, it was a it was a harsh existence. The rules, protocols, um, and the insecurity of royal life may seem strange to us, but it was a brutal reality. So we sh- should also keep in mind that this story did not happen in the time frame of a Hallmark movie. It was years in the making. After all, you know, what, what is time to God? Of the characters treated in the book of Esther, we know little, if anything, from secular history, particularly about the fates of uh, Vashti, uh, Esther, or Mordecai. And like most monarchs of that day, Ahasuerus was a proud man who liked to display his pride. His Persian name was, the best I can pronounce it, say arson. Whether that's right or not, I don't know, but uh, you can look it up if you like. But in Hebrew, it becomes uh, Ahasuerus and Xerxes in the Greek language. His father was Darius I, and his grandfather was Cyrus the Great. His son was the Arthur Xerxes mentioned in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, an interesting thing to note is that the uh, mother of Arthur Xerxes was Vashti. Uh, Ahasuerus ruled over the Persian Empire from 486 to 465 BC. And back then, the uh, king was in absolute control. Ahasuerus' father, Darius I, had invaded Greece and been shamelessly defeated at Marathon in 490 BC. While preparing to return to Greece and get revenge, Darius had died, as in 486 BC. Now, Ahasuerus had his own battles with the Greeks, which I will 
uh, get into a little bit later. But in the first chapter here, we see the uh, three manifestations of his pride. Well, first of all, the first nine verses, we see his uh, boastfulness. As was common with Eastern kings, the lavish banquets were hosted by the kings to impress their guests with their royal power and wealth. Three such banquets are mentioned in this chapter, one for the key military and political officers of the empire, one for the men of Shushan, I mean, that's Susa in Greek, Sia, that's the site of the uh, king's winter palace, then one for the women of Shushan, and that was presided over by Queen Vashti. Along with these three banquets, at least three, uh, six other feasts are recorded in this book. There's Esther's coronation banquet in chapter 2, verse 18. Haman's celebration feast for the king in chapter 3, verse 15. Esther's two banquets for Haman and the king, that's chapters 5 and 7. The Jews' banquets when they heard of the new decree. Uh, chapter 8, verse 17, and the Feast of Purim, that's in chapter 9, verses 17 through 19. Now, these feasts or banquets uh, exemplify how God can accomplish his eternal purposes through such a familiar activity as people eating and drinking. As Paul wrote, therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. First Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 31. Now the purpose of the banquet for the nobles and officials of the empire may have been about a possible invasion of Greece, according to the Greek historian Herodotus. Herodotus. If so, it was important that uh, Ahasuerus impressed his nobles and military leaders, leaders with this wealth and power. When they saw these marble colors, you know, the gorgeous the drapes hung from the silver rings, gold and silver couches on beautiful marble mosaic pavements, golden table service, you know, all those trappings of royalty. What else could they do but uh, submit to the king? Unfortunately for Azarus, uh, this ostentatious display of wealth did not impress the Greeks. In 480 BC, the Persian army was blocked by the Spartan army of Leonidas at the pass of Thermopylae. Now, the Persian navy was destroyed by the Greek navy off the island of Salamis. And in 479 BC, the Persian army was defeated at the Battle of Plataea, and the Navy at the Battle of Macau. If there's ever a man that uh, should have learned the truth of Proverbs 16, 18, it was a hazardous. Pride goes, goes before destruction, and a hearty spirit before a fall. Now, Scripture ignores these matters of a hazardous military campaigns, because the writer's purpose was to explain how Esther became queen and saved her people. Now, people in authority need to remember that all authority comes from God. Romans uh, 13, verse 1, if you want to read that. And that he alone is in complete control. Now, Pharaoh had to learn that lesson in Egypt. You might look at Exodus chapter chapter verse three to five. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn it in Babylon. That's uh, found in Daniel chapters three and four. And also uh, Belshazzar had to learn that. Read that in chapter five. Now Belshazzar learned 
it at his blasphemous banquet. As a side note, this might mention that the Bel Shazer was the father of Vashti. Uh, Sennacherib learned it at the gates of Jerusalem, Isaiah chapters 36 and 37. Here, the grip of the first learned it as he died, being eaten by worms, Acts 12, chapter verses 20 through 23. So every man or woman in a place of authority is second in command for Jesus is Christ and Lord of all. Another thing about uh, Ahasuerus that we note here was his drunkenness. You know, alcohol is a bane of so many uh, people and uh, the uh, cause of so much uh, heartache. It was at the conclusion of the seven-day banquet that Ahasuerus he was merry with wine after the first chapter, verse 10. In this drunken condition, he ordered Vashti to display her beauty to the simple guest, but uh, she refused to obey. Now, tradition has it, it's not the, certainly not in, in scripture, but the tradition has it that she was ordered to appear wearing only her crown. So you know what that means. <clears throat> and as a result of her refusal, uh, the king was furious and his anger burned within him. Chapter 1, one verse 12. We are to be masters of ourselves, but he was not. The wise men of old said, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules the spirit than he who takes the city. Proverbs 16, verse 32. A proverb of Solomon stated that whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Proverbs, the 25th chapter, verse 28. We might add, you know, who should know this truth better than Solomon? King Ahasuerus could control neither his temper nor his thirst. Had the king been sober, would he have asked his wife to display her beauty before the drunk, his drunken leaders? Well, maybe not. But his pride got the best of him. If he could not demonstrate to his nobles and military leaders that he could command his own wife, how could he persuade them that he could command the Persian armies? Since Vashti had embarrassed the king before them, the king had to do something to save both his ego and reputation. To be sure, there is an authorized anger against sin that ought to burn in the heart of every godly person. It's said in Romans 12, verse 9, Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Even our Lord manifested anger at the hardness of heart of the Pharisees, Mark 3rd chapter verse 5. We must be careful that our anger at sin does not become sinful anger. <clears throat> be angry and do not sin, we find in Ephesians 4.26. Jesus equated anger with murder, Matthew 5th chapter verse 21 through 26. Paul warned us to pray without wrath and doubting, the notion being that anger can hinder our praying, 1 Timothy 2nd chapter verse 8. <clears throat> Sometimes what we call righteous indignation is only unrighteous temper masquerading in religious garments. Another thing about uh, Ahasuerus was his vindictiveness. So in the latter part of the first chapter, uh, he's concerned about the repercussions of Vashti's disobedience. So he asked his seven counselors what he should do. But the seven wise men advised the king to depose Vashti and replace her with another queen. 
they promised that uh, such a, an act would put fear in the hearts of all the women in the empire and generate more respect for their husbands. Still motivated by anger and, and revenge and uh, seeking to heal the wounded pride, the king agreed to, uh, to their advice and had Vashti disposed. <clears throat> now the king did not immediately replace Vashti. Instead, he went off to invade Greece, uh, where he met with humiliating defeat, as was already noted. Now the Bible does not tell us what happened to Vashti. Uh, she may have been the mother of Artaxerxes, and he ruled from 464 to 425 BC. Artaxerxes was born in 483. That's the year of the great banquet described in Esther, uh, first chapter. That's when Vashti was uh, removed as queen. And Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes ruled during the times of Ezra. Uh, he's uh, mentioned a number of times in Ezra. And Nehemiah, he's mentioned a number of times in Nehemiah. Like I say, we don't know what happened to Esther, but with Artaxerxes succeeding uh, Ahasuerus upon his death and Vashti being his mother, you know, one can speculate. In any case, the stage was now set for the entrance of two key persons in the drama. Uh, Haman, the man who hated the Jews, and Esther, the woman who delivered her people. So in chapter two, we read about the uh, new queen. That's uh, where Esther becomes king's wife. And Mordecai gets no reward for saving the king's life, which, you know, figures in later. And again, it has to be divine providence for the, exactly how that uh, happened. But Esther was uh, divinely prepared for her role as new queen. As we know, God is never surprised by circumstances or at a loss for prepared servants. He had Joseph and Moses ready in Egypt. He had Ezekiel and Daniel in, in Babylon. And Nehemiah and uh, Shushan or Susa, whichever you prefer. And he had rest, uh, Esther ready to save the, uh, the Jews in the Persian Empire. And as you read this chapter, and even the, uh, throughout the entire book, uh, you'll see the hand of God at work in the affairs of people. So uh, here's the agreement with the uh, king uh, by Haman. That when this has all takes place, it's really uh, about four years that have passed since Vashti was disposed. So these, these things don't just happen, you know, uh, one day after the other. So during that time, you know, Ahasuerus directed his ill-fated uh, Greek campaign and came home in humiliation instead of honor. Also during this time, Ahasuerus had no queen. Now, it was essential for the survival of the Jewish nation that Queen Vashti is not restored. Now, she would certainly not intercede on behalf of the Jews. And she may have uh, cooperated with Haman. Hard to say. But the counselors suggested that the king assemble from all the provinces of the empire the most beautiful young virgins. And the one that pleased the king the most would become his new queen. So we see uh, further in chapter two, the uh, choice of Esther. So we're uh, introduced in verses five through 18, we're introduced to Mordecai and Esther. She was Mordecai's cousin and adopted daughter, verse 15. Her Persian name, Esther, means star. And her Hebrew name, Hadassah, means myrtle. 
like a plant. Yeah, she was a beautiful woman and uh, was selected to be one of the virgins presented to the king. He would say he was said that he loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Esther. That's in Esther, the second chapter, verse 17. And of course, we're talking about providence, but uh, <clears throat> we should uh, keep in mind that uh, you know the, the appointment of, of Esther as the uh, queen, it doesn't mean that God forced Ahasuerus to accept the plan to make Esther the queen. It simply means that God so directed the people in this situation that uh, decisions were made that accomplished God's purpose. As we read in Proverbs, the 21st chapter, verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. Even in the affairs of a pagan empire, God is in control. Just as Joseph found favor in Egypt, uh, Genesis 39, chapter 21, and, and Daniel in Babylon, Daniel, first chapter, verse 9. So Esther found favor in, in uh, Jerusalem, or Susa. Mordecai charged Esther not to reveal her people or family. Had Esther not been a Jewess, or if she had not kept silent about it, she could never have saved the Jews from slaughter. Esther had won the favor of all who saw her, including the king. She obtained, as it said, grace and favor in the sight more than all the uh, other virgins. So she was made queen. It is unlikely that Esther or Mordecai knew where all of this was headed. But God wanted Esther in the royal palace where she could uh, intercede for her people. We read in Acts 15, chapter, verse 18, known to God from eternity are, are all his works. They may not have known about it, but, but God did. So the king personally placed the crown on uh, Esther's head and named her the new queen of the empire. Then he summoned his officials and hosted a great banquet. And that's the fourth banquet mentioned in the book. So let's uh, consider uh, Mordecai. In verse 19, we now see uh, Mordecai in a position of honor and authority sitting at the king's gate. Uh, that's in Esther 4, chapter verse 2, and also chapter 5, verse 13. Now, this is an important place because that's the uh, ancient equivalent of our modern law courts. That's a place where important official business was transacted. You, know, you, you can look at the Ruth 4th chapter, verse 1, see that, and Daniel, the second chapter, verses 48 and 49. That's just the way they did things back then. Mordecai was able to use this position for the good of both the uh, king and the Jews. He discovered the plot of the two doorkeepers to lay hands on the king. So he told Esther, and Esther informed the king, and you know she gave Mordecai the, Mordecai the credit. So Mordecai's name was written in the official chronicle, and that's an important fact that comes to play later. The plot was confirmed, and the two uh, perpetrators were hanged. And back at that time, intrigue was a, an ever-present reality threatening the life of uh, kings generally. In fact, 14 years later, Ahasuerus was assassinated. So Mordecai received neither immediate recognition nor reward for saving the king's life. That was unusual back at that time. But God saw to it that the facts were currently recorded. 
and he would make a good use of them at, at the right time. Our good works are like seeds that are planted by faith, <clears throat> the fruits of which would do not always appear immediately. In Proverbs, the 13th chapter, verse 21, we read, Evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. Now, you may recall that Joseph uh, befriended a fellow prisoner, and the man completely forgot his kindness until two years later. Now, the plot hatched by the doorkeepers uh, that Mordecai successfully ex exposed, that was nothing compared to the plot that he would uncover four years later, planned and perpetrated, perpetrated, perpetrated perpetrated by evil uh, Haman, who was, of course, the enemy of the Jews. Now, there, there was peace during the first four years of Esther's reign as queen, and Mordecai tended to the king's business at the gate. When we do a quick reading of uh, Esther, we kind of get the idea this happened just maybe within a week's time. That's not the way it was. But during this, at the end of that time, uh, Haman changed everything because of his hatred of Mordecai and, and by extension, all the Jews. Haman was an, a, a guy, guy, which means he came, uh, well, it could mean he came from a district of the empire known as Agag. But it could also mean that he was descended from Agag, king of the Amalekites. 1 Samuel 15, chapter verse 8. Now, if the latter is the case, then we can easily understand why Haman hated the Jews. God had declared war on the Amalekites and declared that one day he would destroy them because of their treacherous attack on the Israelites as they entered the promised land. We find that both in Exodus and Deuteronomy. It was Saul, the first king of Israel, whom God commanded to destroy the Amalekites, 1 Samuel 15th chapter. But he failed in this commission, and he lost his crown. And there's two interesting side notes. Um, one is that King Saul, a Benjamite, failed to destroy the Amalekites. But Mordecai, also a Benjamite, took, a, took up the battle and defeated Haman. Another fact is the founder of the Amalekites was a descendant of Esau, Genesis 36, chapter 12. And Esau was the brother, uh, enemy of his brother Jacob. So everything about Haman was uh, hateful. You could not find one pra uh, praiseworthy thing about this man. In fact, everything about Haman, God hated. In Proverbs 6, chapter verse 16 through 19, it uh, set forth there the six things that the Lord hates, yet seven that are an abomination to him. Haman had every one of these detestable attributes. Now, at, uh, in Esther, the third chapter, verse one, the first part of it, the second part of it, uh, at some time between the seventh and twelfth years of the reign of, of Hazarus, the king made Haman chief officer in the empire. Now, this was an unwarranted appointment, but we must keep in mind the psalmist encouragement in the 39th Psalm that we are not to fret because of evildoers nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like grass. God permitted Haman to be appointed to this high office because he had purposes to fulfill through him. You might look at uh, Exodus 9, chapter verse 16, and Romans 9, verse 17. We must keep in mind that Haman acted out of his own volition, which God used for the glory of his people. His actions were not compelled by God. 
what people do with authority is a test of character. Do they use their authority to promote themselves or to help others? Do they glorify themselves or glorify God? Daniel was given a high position like Haman's, but he used his authority to honor God and help others. Of course, the difference between, between Daniel and Haman is that Daniel was a humble man of God, while Haman was a proud man of the world. Now, we can see Haman's uh, vanity in Esther, first part of Esther, chapter 3. Haman's uh, promotion uh, may have brought out the worst in Haman, but it brought out the best in Mordecai. Haman was a small man in a big office, not content with merely having a high office and using it. Haman also wanted public recognition and honor. But the king had to issue a special edict concerning Haman, demanding his servants to bow down to him. But Mordecai refused to pay homage to Haman. The verb translated pay homage or reverence in verses three, uh, chapter two, uh, chapter three, verse two, and chapter three, verse five is used at times to include obeisance or uh, to or reverence of kings and, and those in positions of high authority. Uh, examples are Joseph's brothers when they bow down to him, worship, uh, many times worship God or idols even, and many other examples, all quite customary in, in those societies. So why did Haman, uh, Mordecai refuse to honor Haman? Uh, perhaps it was because Haman was a Amalekite, a sworn enemy of the Jews. Perhaps it was due to the emphasis Haman placed on it. He may have considered it more than just an honorific. Mordecai just would not humor Haman with such a delusion. The other officials at the gate questioned Mordecai about his behavior, and it was then that Mordecai openly announced that he was a Jew. Eventually, they reported his behavior to Haman. From that time on, Haman, filled with wrath, sought to destroy all the Jews in the empire in Mordecai in the process. Mordecai's controversy with Haman was not a personal quarrel with a proud and, a proud and difficult man. Mordecai was not nurturing a personal grudge against Haman or anyone else. Mordecai's declaration that he would not uh, bow down to the Amalekite, Haman, there by disobeying civil authority, <clears throat> was an exercise of his conscience against evil that if left unattended would result in the destruction of the Jews. And Mordecai is not the only person in the Bible <clears throat> who for conscience sake disobeyed civil authority. The Hebrew midwives disobeyed Pharaoh's orders and refused to kill the Jewish ba uh, babies. You find that in the first uh, chapter of Exodus. <clears throat> Daniel and his three uh, friends refused to eat the king's food. You find that in the first chapter of Daniel. And the three friends also refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's image in the third chapter of Daniel. The apostles refused to stop teaching in Jerusalem and affirmed we must obey God rather than men, Acts 5.29. In view of Romans 13, civil disobedience can be a powerful statement of faith <clears throat> or a cowardly escape from responsibility. Now, Amon was a very subtle uh, person. His uh, plan to destroy the Jews was a very meticulous plan. Even prior to approaching Ahasuerus with his uh, evil plan, he selected the day for the destruction of the Jews by having certain people, that's probably the court astrologers, <clears throat> Cast lots, or in, in the Hebrew, Pur. That's to determine the day of the Jews' destruction. And it uh, turned out to be 11 months uh, hence. Find that in Esther 3rd chapter 7. 
in God's good providence, this gave the Jews close to a year to get ready. Also would give Mordecai and Esther time to act. As we read in Proverbs 16, chapter verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So even this casting of Pur uh, was by God's providence. Yeah, I have to keep in mind, too, that this uh, delay gave Haman time to enjoy the panic of the Jews. When Haman requested the king's permission in front of Esther 3 to destroy the Jews, he did not name his intended target, but only that it was a people who did not keep the king's law. <clears throat> now, Haman, uh, Haman was correct when he described the Jews as people whose laws are different from all other peoples. Their laws were different because they were God's chosen people who alone received God's holy law from his own hand. Moses asked, and what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgment as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Fourth chapter Deuteronomy verse 8. The answer is none. Brother Haman offered to pay the king 10,000 talents, that's a tidy sum of money, 10,000 talents of silver, silver for the privilege of ridding the empire of these dangerous law-breaking people. Now I wonder where he would get those 10,000 talents. Without asking any questions, the king foolishly gave Haman his royal signet ring, which granted Haman the authority to act in the king's name. He could write any document he pleased put the king's seal on it, and the doctrine had to be accepted as law and obeyed. Haman immediately spread the word, Esther, the third chapter, verse 12 and 14. <clears throat> the official document was given to the royal couriers who quickly carried it to every part of the empire. We also see Haman's apathy. He and the king completely ignored the plight of, of the Jews. And you might say they kicked back and had a cold one, so, uh, so to speak. Meanwhile, the people of the capital city were perplexed. They did not know what to do or what to make of the, of the decree. Secluded in her royal quarters, Queen Esther knew nothing about the danger that she and her people faced. While the Jews in the various provinces began to fast and mourn, and we find that in the fourth chapter of Esther, verse 3, only one man, Mordecai, was able to do anything about the girl, and he immediately began to act. Chapter 4, we see uh, it's a day of decision. So the first part, uh, Mordecai expresses his concern. Now, Mordecai's appearance and actions, verse 1, are those of a person showing great grief. And we see this uh, in other uh, parts of the Bible, 2 Samuel, the first uh, part of chapter 1, and David's mourning on the death of Saul. 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 13, verse 9, Tamar weeping with a brother Amnon sent her away in 2 Samuel 18 chapter verse 33 when David uh, wept for Absalom or a deep repentance in Jonah and Nehemiah uh, of course Nehemiah on the reading of the law the people wept so Mordecai was neither afraid nor ashamed to let people know where he stood he had already told the officers at the gate that he was a Jew now he was telling the whole city that that he was not only a Jew, but also that he opposed this uh, murderer's edict. Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart, hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render each man according to his deeds? Now, these solemn words come from Proverbs, the 24th chapter, verses 11 and 12. 
And it makes clear that we cannot be neutral when human lives are at stake. And Mordecai ended his mournful pilgrimage at the King Gate, which again is a commercial and legal hub of the city. It's a combination of marketplace and courtroom. That was as far as he could go because no sackcloth uh, was permitted to come within the gate. Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about that uh, uh, Mordecai was dressed in sackcloth and ashes morning at the king's gate. Since she was not told the reason for her cousin's strange conduct, she did, I suppose, the logical thing and sent him fine clothes put on lest his sackcloth arouse the concern of the king's officers and guards. So in the middle part of uh, chapter 4 of Esther, we see that Mordecai explains the peril. Well, he refused the new clothes, but that gave him the opportunity to get his vital message to the queen, where he sent one of her eunuchs, Hathash, to the gate to ask Mordecai what was wrong. Mordecai not only knew all the facts about the decree, but he also had a copy of it for Esther to read for herself. And Mordecai did more, much more than inform the queen. He urged her to go to the royal uh, throne room and intercede for her people. Now, the big question after he, after he did this was, how, do, how would Esther respond to this crisis? So again, in Esther, the fourth chapter, verse 10 to 14, uh, what, verse 10 11, Esther replied to Mordecai. She reminded Mordecai of what he already knew, that nobody, not even the queen, could enter the king's inner court without first being summoned, summoned on penalty of death, unless the king holds out uh, his golden scepter. So she informed Mordecai of this, but Mordecai knew palace protocol before he made the appeal to Esther. And of course, uh, Esther had not been summoned for 30 days at that point. In his reply, Mordecai reminded Esther of three solemn facts. First, he told her that her being a palace resident was no guarantee that she would be delivered from death. The royal edict said all the Jews. And Haman would see to it that every Jew was discovered and slain, even those in the palace. Second, Mordecai reminded her that her silence would not prevent deliverance from uh, coming from some other source. The reference here is to the providence of God, even though the name of God is, is not mentioned. Knowing the Abrahamic uh, covenant, with the you know uh, promise made to Abraham, I'll make you a great nation. Find that in Genesis 12 chapter. Mordecai had the faith that the people of Israel would be protected from annihilation. He may not have known exactly how, but he had faith. Moreover, he warned her that even if deliverance did come, some of the Jews might still be slain, and Esther might be among them. And Mordecai emphasized a third fact. Her being in the palace was not an accident. For it just might be that she had come to the kingdom for such a time as this. 14 verse of chapter 4. Upon reflection, she could not help but see that there had been divine providence in every action. And if God brought her to the throne, then he had a purpose in mind. And that purpose was now evident. She was there to intercede for her people. The statement of Joseph to his brothers comes to mind. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Uh, Genesis 50, 50, chapter 20. <clears throat> now there's some basic truths about the problems of God to be learned here, and, and there are uh, they're important to Christians today. First is that God has divine purposes to accomplish in this world, which purposes will not be frustrated. 
God's purposes involved the Jewish nation as well as the Gentile nations of the world. They also involve the church. God deals with individuals as well as with nations. His purposes touch the lives of kings and queens and common people, godly people, and wicked people. There is nothing in this world that is outside the influence of the purposes of God. Nebuchadnezzar came to the realization that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will and sits over it the lowest of men. Find that in, of course, Daniel, a number of places there. Uh, fourth chapter and verse uh, chapter uh, five. We may readily admit that the most high rules on the kingdom level, but do we allow the Lord to rule in the hearts? That's an important question. Last Sunday, of course, that's the 24th Christmas Eve, David, uh, he delivered a sermon, a very good sermon. He's used as its uh, pretext of first 10 verses of the 18th chapter of Jeremiah that has to do with the clay in the potter's hand and the relevant verses that he used uh, are 1 through 10 the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words and I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and turning a kingdom to pluck up, pull down, and destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instance I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey, my voice then, and my voice, then I will relent concerning the good in which I said I would benefit it. And the idea here is that he rules in the kingdom of men. So Mordecai made it clear that God accomplishes his purposes through people. How providence works, we do not fully understand. Actions today likely have their genesis years, even generations prior. It is very complicated, this providence. God permits evil people to do evil and do, uh, good people to do good of their own volition. He works in and through saints and sinners to accomplish his purposes. In this book of Esther, there is no indication that God forced anyone to act contrary to their heart's inclination. While he is not the author of any sin, God used the king's drunkenness and his foolishness in opposing Vashti to accomplish his own ends. Further, he used the uh, king's desire for a queen to place Esther on the throne. And in chapter 6, he used the king's sleeplessness to reward Mordecai and start to overthrow the power of Haman. In great things and little things, God is sovereign. This is the lesson of the potter and the clay. The third truth that Mordecai emphasized was that God will accomplish his purposes even if his servants refuse to obey his will. If Esther rejected the will of God, God would still save his people, but Esther would be the loser. If you and I refuse to obey God, he will either abandon us and get someone else to do the job, or and we will lose, uh, lose the reward and blessing, or he will discipline us until we surrender to his will. Here are two of many examples throughout the Bible. After John Mark left the mission field and returned home, find that in the 13th and 15th chapters of Acts and the resulting disagreement between Paul, uh, Paul and Barnabas. God raised up Timothy to accompany Paul, 16th chapter of Acts. As a result, there were two mission teams in the field rather than one. 
when Jonah ran from God, the Lord kept after him until he obeyed. And even then, Jonah did not want to obey. When God is not permitted to rule, he overrules. And he always accomplishes his purposes. The fourth lesson that uh, from Mordecai's speech is that God is not in a hurry, but will fulfill his plans in due time. God waited until the third year of the king's reign before taking Vashti off the throne. Then he waited another four years before putting Esther on the throne. It was not until the king's twelfth year that God allowed Haman to hatch his evil plot. And through the casting of lots, decreed that the day of reckoning of the Jews, or for the Jews, would be almost a year away. God is never in a hurry. He knows the end from the beginning, and his decrees are always right and always on time. To emphasize again, the sovereignty of God does not mitigate against one's free will. Only a sovereign God is great enough to decree freedom of choice for men and women. And only a sovereign God could fulfill his purposes, even make an evil corporate in producing good. The question is not, is God in control of the world, but is God in control of my life? Are we part of the answer or part of the problem? And uh, Mordecai in chapter 4, he, he uh, expedited the plan and he said in, in the third uh, verse of chapter 4, in every province where the king's command of free arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing and many lay in salt, uh, sack, cloth, and ashes. So Jews, uh, they, since they were throughout the empire were already fasting, weeping, and wailing, it was not difficult for Mordecai to unite the Jews in Shushan to pray for Esther as she prepared to intercede before the king. This was a matter of life and death both for her and her people. And God used the crisis that Haman had created to bring a spiritual revival to his people scattered among the Gentiles. It is often that adversity causes God's people to humble themselves before God. Although we may revile the suffering that adversity brings, God uses it to temper his people. Esther's words, and if I perish, I perish, are an expression of her confidence in the Lord, come what may. Esther echoes the same surrender and confidence that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego expressed when they refused to obey the decree of Nebuchadnezzar to, to fall down and worship him. They told him that if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. That's in the third chapter of Daniel. So let's look at uh, a day in the life of uh, Haman. I, I call him the prime minister. I don't know what their, his official title was, but he kind of acts like a prime minister, so that's what I'll call him. Uh, let's be reminded of the words of the psalm of David in 7th Psalm, verses 14 and 16. Behold, the wicked bring forth, brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. Haman is the epitome of the wicked who is digging his pit with barbarian. He just keeps on digging. As Moses said to the Reubenites, be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers uh, 30, 2nd chapter verse 23. Haman did not realize it, but four forces had already begun to work together to destroy him. First one is divine sovereignty, first part of Esther 5. Esther was concerned whether the king would acknowledge her presence and grant her an audience. If he did not, it would mean her immediate execution. A king, and especially this king, could be unpredictable. 
her life would be dependent on his mood. The Jews had been fasting and praying for three days, no doubt asking God to intervene and save them from annihilation. So now Esther had died. What Esther did ranks among the great deeds of faith in Scripture. It was not enough for the Jews to praise, uh, to pray and have faith that God would work. Somebody had to act. For as James says, faith without works is dead. But Esther was not operating based on blind faith. She knew of the Abrahamic covenant that's in Genesis chapter 12. And the promise made to Solomon in Second Chronicles 7, chapter verse 14. Furthermore, God had always uh, had allowed a remnant of Jews to return to the land and rebuild the temple. It was through this remnant that the Christ was to come. <clears throat> Esther prepared herself to meet the king by putting on a royal robe. Recall that Ruth also prepared herself to meet Boaz. You can see, find that in Ruth chapter 3. The king officially recognized his queen and invited her to share her petition with him. Again, God is sovereign and in control. It's, it's more up, so. We read in We read in Proverbs 19 chapter verse 21 that there are many plans in a man's heart Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Also in Proverbs 21st chapter, verse 1, the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Esther did not immediately inform the king about Haman's evil plot. For one thing, it was just not the right time. It was unlikely that the king was prepared to believe the evidence that his number one officer was a scoundrel. If she had in the first meeting come right out and said so, the Hazarus may have considered uh, her accusation an act of treason. Uh, it's not just a piece of gossip. Uh, there is no doubt how Haman would have reacted. But neither was it the right place for her to intercede. There were, uh, there's no doubt there were retainers serving the king in the throne room. And it would not have been a, it would have been a breach of palace etiquette for the queen to make her plea publicly. The sight of a weeping, pleading woman for the throne might have annoyed the king and made matters worse. Better she should speak to the king in the privacy of her own quarters than in the throne room. Third reason is that Esther wanted Haman, and only Haman, present when he, she told the queen, uh, king about his evil plot. If Haman was caught off guard, perhaps he would in some fashion admit his guilt or uh, do something foolish that would anger the king. I mean, that turned out, of course, to be the correct approach. But there's a fourth reason, one that uh, Esther herself was unaware of at that time. One more event had to intervene before she could share her burden with the king, and it would take place that very night. And another example of divine providence after awakening, awakening from a troubled sleep, the he, uh, king had the chronicles read to him. From this reading, the king would discover that he uh, had never rewarded Mordecai for saving his life five years before. He therefore resolved that he would rectify that mistake immediately. He would honor Mordecai, but this honor would at the same time humiliate Haman, and this experience would help prepare the king to hear Esther's petition. Esther's banquet was already prepared. This Haman, this Haman and the king had to hurry to attend. In answer to prayer, God so worked in the king's heart that he not only cooperated willingly with his queen, he made Haman cooperate. Again, we see the wonder of the providence of God. In the middle part of chapter 5, Haman considered an honor to attend a special banquet with the king and queen alone and in the king's private quarters. Under normal circumstances, that was true. It is unlikely that any other official in the empire had ever been so honored. As Haman ate and drank with Hazarus and Esther, his confidence grew. He was indeed an important man in the kingdom and his future was secure, so he thought. 
when the king asked Esther, Esther to state her petitions, he gave the prime minister even more confidence. For here were the king and the queen discussing a personal matter in his presence. Haman was not only the king's confidence, but now he was sharing the, the intimate concerns of the queen as well. Since the queen had invited him to the banquet, she must certainly value his counsel. At the banquet, we see three more evidences of the sovereignty of God. First, the Lord restrained Esther from telling Ahasuerus the truth about Haman. While there may have been fear in her heart, God was delaying the great exposure until after the king had honored Mordecai. We also see the sovereign hand of God at work where the king accepted the delay and agreed to come to the second bank. Monarchs like Ahasuerus are not accustomed to being told to wait. Whatever plans Ahasuerus had made for the next evening were canceled to make time for the queen's second banquet. The third evidence of God's sovereignty is that none of Esther's attendants who knew that she was a Jewess tried to convey this important information to Haman. Had Haman known the queen's nationality and given the decree against the Jews, he would have likely devised some plan to prevent her from interfering. Palace intrigue is a dangerous game and any of the attendants could have profited by telling Haman what they knew. The fact that Esther invited Haman to the second bank would only increase this evil man's confidence. And that is exactly the response the queen wanted. If her en enemy was overconfident, she knew it would lead to a fall. Proverbs 28, chapter verse 26 reads, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Like the rich man in the Lord's parable, uh, Luke 12, chapter verse 16 to 21, Haman was confident that he was set for life when he was just a few hours away from death. Like, likewise, King Belshazzar held a great feast during which he blasphemed the God of Israel. And by sending handwriting on the wall, God announced his doom. That very night, Babylon was conquered and Belshazzar was slain. The only safe place to put your confidence is in the Lord. In 10th and 12th verses of uh, Esther chapter 5, we see more about uh, Haman. It was uh, with a narcissistic attitude that Haman left the palace and returned home with a joyful heart. Fresh from an intimate dinner with the king and queen and anticipating a second banquet the next evening, Haman launched himself on an eagle trip as he left. The king had advanced him above the officials and servants of the king. He was like the rich man in Luke 12, chapter verse 16 through 21, whose favorite word was I. We read that pride goes before destruction and haughty spirit before fall, and that a man's Pride will bring, bring him low. Anybody boasting about position, wealth, family, and so forth ought to heed the words of John the Baptist. A man can receive nothing unless it is given to him from above. John 3rd chapter verse 27. Paul asks, For who makes you different from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? First Corinthians, uh, the fourth chapter, verse 7. If these truths were known to Haman, they would go unheeded. And we see the malice of uh, Haman. When the, Haman left the queen's palace joyful and with a glad heart, uh, and why shouldn't he if his assessment of the situation is true? Well, whether that's true or not, the sight of Mordecai immediately brought him down to earth again on, on a previous occasion. Mordecai had refused to bow down to Haman, but he even refused to stand up and acknowledge Haman's presence. So Haman was filled with the indignation against Mordecai in the first nine of chapter five. His hatred of the Jews in general and Mordecai in particular had so poisoned his system that he could not even revel in his assumed greatness. He said that his gladness of heart at uh, being the only other one invited by Queen Esther to the ensuing banquet with the king 
as he said, avails me nothing as, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Malice is that deep-seated hatred that brings the light if our enemy suffers and pain if our enemy succeeds. Malice can never forgive. It must always take revenge. Malice has a good memory for hurts and it has a bad memory for kindnesses. In 1 Corinthians 5th chapter verse 8, Paul warned the Corinthians to purge out the leaven of malice and wickedness and replace it with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Malice begins small and insignificant, as does yeast that grows to permeate the whole loaf. Malice in the Christian's heart grieves the Holy Spirit and must be put out of, out of our lives. Ephesians 4th chapter verses 30 and 32 and Colossians 3 verse 8. Malice will not long remain dormant. It must act. Eventually, it must express itself. If a person wants to self-destruct, the fastest way to do it is like, to be like Haman and cultivate a malicious spirit. His wife and friends, also having a sinful hatred of the Jews, suggested that he have a gallows built and then asked the king for permission to hang Mordecai on it. He thought this to be a splendid idea and he had a gallows built. Now, Mordecai was a prominent a citizen of the, of the uh, city. If Haman could have executed him, it would frighten the Jews and convince them that the king meant business when he approved the edict. It would traumatize the Jewish people, and Haman would have them at his mercy. Of course, this was before Ahasuerus had his uh, troubled sleep, arose, and then read in the Chronicles that Mordecai had saved his life. We can now see God's good providence in Esther's delay in offering her petition to the king. The delay worked against Haman's plot to rid himself of Mordecai. Of course, after the events in chapter 6, it would be impossible for Haman to get permission to execute Mordecai. He wouldn't even dare ask. The gallows intended for Mordecai turned out to be the instrument of Haman's own execution. We are reminded that for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths, his own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, folly he shall go astray. Proverbs 5th chapter, verses 21 through 23. Now that's the end of chapter 5. Uh, next time, whatever the next time is, I'll take up chapter 6. In the meantime, you can you can read Esther again, but uh, for me anyway, you'll have to find out the, the rest of the story the next time I uh, speak. So that concludes uh, the lesson for tonight. Before we go, though, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Bow with me, please. And Father, we thank Thee for this study, for the example that Thou uh, has set before us to teach us of Thy goodness and uh, good providence for our own good. May we always rely on thee, keep our heart pure, and always seek out thy will, not our own. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.